Good morning, everybody. And thank you for joining us to this uh, session. You know, there's a lot of other parallel sessions, so thank you for choosing us. So just a quick introduction from the panel uh, team members, and I'm sorry that an uh, uh, offer from uh, Lumika couldn't join us for a personal reason. So please, if you can just introduce yourself. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> on? Yes. So I'm Maria Penanen from Germany, from Frankfurt. I'm presenting Accelerator Frankfurt. We have a FinTech accelerator where we, you could say it's a, like a go-to accelerator. We help, for example, the Israeli FinTechs enter the German market. We help them with POCs and getting investments. Good morning. I'm Laurent Nizri, the founder and CEO of the Paris FinTech Forum, the largest digital finance and FinTech event in Europe. Uh, for example, we bring you that book at the end in partnership with the organizer here. Thank you again. Um, and uh, we are trying to get, uh, since a few years now, co a definition for co-petition. I mean, FinTech definitely they want to compete at the beginning. At the end of the day, they want to work with and banks, insurance, big telco, quite the same. At the beginning, they see all that as competition and they understand that they can work with. And it's what we are doing with our, our forum, trying to put them together to work together. We'll discuss that later. Hello, everyone. Near Milo. I'm uh, responsible for strategic innovation for DNH. DNH, uh, for the ones who, doesn't know us, who don't know us, uh, we are one of the largest fintech companies in the world, uh, covering payment, lending, financial services, and so on. The interesting part about DNH nowadays is that we are actually in the merge process with MySage, which would turn us uh, to be the third largest fintech company in the world, covering all banking solutions, uh, corporate, retail, lending, uh, payment, transaction banking, and so on. So guys, we are going to do some open discussion later on. So if you have any kind of questions, please write it down or just memorize it. And then we will have the time for, uh, for questions from the audience. So I think the first question that I would like to, to, to address the, the panel is around the current status right now happening between really big financial institutions, not just banks, big financial institutions and fintech companies. And I, I think from our perspective, from KPMG perspective, the last two years was quite amazing. We are finally get to see a lot of collaborations or integrations finally happening and I would just like to see to get from your view from your local market view from the French market from the German market from your global market of course what is the current status right now that you are seeing happening between financial institutions and, uh, and fintech companies yeah I, th <clears throat> I think we can see it in Germany that even the big banks are I, of course I think about more about banks but yes all I think all the finance institutes insurance companies also are really willing to, to work with startups and uh, I think it's it's how to define then this cooperation I think it, sometimes we have some difficulties but we of course do concretely that we help them to scout the right kind of startups that they can work with that it's of course easier when the finance institute knows what their problem is and sometimes we even need to help them to define what that problem is but I think the, it's, it's moving to the right direction from more let's say cosmetic ways of it, doing innovation together to really try and to find those ways of integrating you know, the startups activities or maybe the products that they have to their current portfolio. If we begin by banks perhaps, because insurance is a bit different, but by banks, what we've seen in Europe in the last three years is a, a big pass, uh, move forward. I mean, at the beginning three years ago, it was like, okay, why are those new kids trying to take our business without understanding what is finance? Globally, it was that. And uh, the fine fintech guy was just trying to do article in press media saying we will kill banks. So a few, few months later, uh, they begin to try to work together. And now what we've seen, for example, this year we received 600 applications to be on our stage uh, for fintechs. And perhaps two thirds of them have met a pivot in the past 12 months from B2C to B2B2C. In fact, they just understood that to make money in finance, you need to come with money. Uh, so the problem is if you want to do a new bank, if you want to do a big wealth management firm or whatever, it's not because you raise 30 million euro that you do something. It's just the beginning. So, um, and of course, as you may know, in fintech, most of the time you have much more customers than, than tech. It's more fincust than fintech. So the money, they put it mainly in UX and finding customer, and that's a big difficulty. So they say, okay, the banks, they have the money, they have customers, but they have really not good innovation. Sorry for the bankers. So um, what can we do together? So they begin to try to work with them, but they didn't want, knew on which door to knock. And the good thing is the banks, after a few years, they say, hey, 
perhaps it's interesting to work with these guys because it's true that even if we have the customer, even if we have the money, we begin to have some difficulties to innovate because we are stuck in our own processes, stuck in our own, own uh, way of thinking. We think that's not possible, but perhaps it is, in fact, after all. So after the, the time of the incubator or the accelerator or whatever, you've seen plenty of tr real try of more than POC. Real, okay, you want to sell me something? Come in my normal process. Show me that you can do it. And so now you have, of course, a classical buyout. You have some big one recently in Europe. They just bought, for example, BNP, just spent 200 on plus million to buy a, a fintech in B2C banking, but that's still an exception. Most of the time, what you don't see in the newspaper are the cooperation, like IT cooperation and B2B2C, and that uh, allow all these companies to, to live, to have a bit of money, and to continue their B2C approach sometime on the side. It's what we see now. Perhaps later we can go on the InsurTech one, which is a bit different. So I think that uh, there are a couple of trends that are uh, worth uh, mentioning. One is uh, uh, I think that startups are getting into higher in the maturity uh, uh, phase in terms of uh, being ready to work with banks. Uh, from uh, two people that are working in a garage, uh, we see more startups that are actually either ex-bankers or you know guys that know how to work with banks and that's that makes a lot of difference uh, the other thing is that we see from the other end that banks uh, you know as my colleagues mentioned banks are open to cooperate with startups with fintechs uh, regulatory is encouraging open uh, banking open api and, and so on encouraging uh, to put the right trails in, and even in uh, jurisdictions that there are no such regulatories, bank would uh, voluntarily go that way. Uh, and the third aspect that I'd like to mention is um, uh, the long tail, if you wish. So we see a couple of large uh, and global banks, and uh, maybe uh, re large regional banks that are very active with uh, fintechs and startup, but there are hundreds and thousands of banks out there, smaller, medium, the medium level in terms of assets and so on, that um, you know, they just want to get the business done and they want to enjoy the benefit of innovation and customer uh, you know, acquisition and so on and so on that you know, fintechs could offer. And those guys would not engage with fintechs until their solution is, is, is proofed by other banks. Lorraine, just a follow-up question. What about insurance? Your market, French market, the German market, what's happening there? This is only guarded by the banks or do you see some, the ugly stepsister of the financial services yes. also jumping in? You mean the insurtech market, right. yeah. Yeah, it's quite different. Um, two years ago for the first edition, we had on 600 application, one insurtech. <laughs> this year we had like 20%. And already I began since February to look a bit all around the world. It's more than 30%. A lot of insurtech innovation. There is an explanation why insurance comes later. In Europe, at least, uh, the market of banking is production, distribution, vertical. A bank produces products and sells its product. You cannot buy a current account of Credit Agricole somewhere in the street. But you can buy an insurance of AXA somewhere in the street. Because uh, insurance has, has been disrupted in distribution since day one. And if you look what happened in um, fintech in general, in finance, in B2C market, it was mainly a disruption of the distribution. It was easier. You don't have to really to produce a product. You just have to know how to perhaps sell it differently or use it differently. But the insurance market, they didn't wait 2017 to do that. They do that forever. Of course, perhaps they were not totally mobile or whatever. And well, they were a bit, in fact. You can, for example, in most of the big insurance in Europe, you can buy fully digital without signing any paper since years. So that's why it was a bit more long, because you have to find where you can disrupt. And usually in insurance, it's a very uh, um, intensive usage of people. You have a lot of people in the back end, you know, to, to, to manage the claims, the, the, the issues and so on. And there is where you need something. And the insurance companies are really willing to work with Essential Tech because it's years they have already optimized all they can do by themselves and they need to always optimize a bit better. And they see the InsurTech as, okay, help us. Help us to go even further to satisfy our customer when it's the worst time. Because I remind you a big difference between banks and insurance. Banks, they speak with you every day 
Insurance, they speak with you once a year at the best, and usually they speak with you when it's not a good moment. Uh, so you are in a bad situation and whatever, and y you need to be well treated, and in the same time, the company insurance need not to be bankrupt. So it's, it's not so easy. So they are trying to find plenty of new ways to do that, and you have a lot of insurance, uh, insurtech, coming on that market, directly B2B, not even B2B2C, just B2B, helping them. And then you have a new, new brand of, uh, of insurtechs in this year, three months already, three months, four months. You have some in Europe asking full license. So they are full insurance. They just want to build their own insurance. Good luck, it's a very capital intensive market, but they are beginning it. For example, we have one, we have Alan, uh, and some others are coming. We'll see next year what happens, they just get their license, but that's an interesting way. Maria, from your market? Yeah, I think, uh, well, well, first of all, if you think about the, the banking industry, I think there's like 6,500 banks in, on the ECB, and half of them actually come from German-speaking countries. And I think in Germany we have maybe, I don't know, 150 insurance companies. I think it gives you the, the perspective that it is probably much more concentrated, this industry. But I, I agree that uh, there is a lot of potential how to do it. It's not maybe just in the, in the saving cost, but in other ways trying to, to renew the way how, how you do the business. But uh, yeah, everybody says this is the untapped market, so we are also looking for applications on this area. Let's speak about the challenges for, for a second. So Nir, you are coming from, a, let's say, a big fintech company. 1.25 billion dollar of uh, an exit, let's say, uh, two years ago um, by DNH, and now you are working with MySys for a core banking system vendor, so it's, you're going to become even bigger, even larger. And from your, from your perspective, working with financial institutions all over, over the world, even as a big fintech company, um, what are the biggest challenges from the you know, infrastructure perspective or working with the right stakeholders within the organization? And the second question that I want to address the panel is by working with financial statisticians, do you have to work with the um, innovation team or the digital team or can you walk through the main current stream of the bank? Do you have to work with the, a small separated jet boat or you can walk directly with the business stakeholders? Um, I think that, uh, from my experience, a uh, couple of things. Um, the first one is, uh, it goes to, you know, how, do, how to engage with banks, right? So banks got, um, uh, you know, certain business structure uh, that would cover different areas. So, you know, retail banking is not similar to corporate banking, investment banking is different, and so on and so on. So you have to find the champion at the bank that would actually be interested, got the pain that you are in a position to solve. Once you have that champion that is really under pain, and you could provide a solution, you got your path in, okay? Uh, and then that champion will find a way to um, work with the bank uh, uh, internal acquisition process, and so on and so on. Uh, the other aspect to that is, um, you know, every bank is as advanced as the bank is, got their legacy systems. Okay, those legacy systems could be, uh, you know, older or, or newer, but they put a lot of um, complexities and limitations uh, on uh, accepting new technologies. And recognizing that, would be very valuable for any companies that's trying to uh, come and work with banks, because at the end of the day, the bank need integration between all, this, uh, all the systems. Uh, so that would be the second aspect. Uh, the third aspect that I had in mind is about innovation and, and, and business. I think that innovation is a great way to get in. Uh, banks are looking at innovation on, you know, different perspective, working with fintechs is just one of those aspects that, uh, that would be part of the innovation strategy of a financial institution or a bank, and everyone should be aware that, you know, at the end of the day, the innovation group should uh, commercialize the solutions that they would come, whether those are internally uh, built or, you know, sourced externally, and they would have to land it with the right, uh, you know, business partner. I have two ways to answer your question. First, uh, a nice symbol, uh, Banque de France, uh, so like the Federal Reserve for France, uh, they just nominated a few months ago a chief digital officer. Okay, five years after all the banks, but I mean, it's still something. 
so you have a central bank who has uh, a chief digital officer now to be the entry point for any open innovation from outside. It's not anymore someone here, someone here. And it's quite the same in all banks. I mean, in the past it was you knew someone, or better, you play golf with a CEO. And then you can perhaps sometime go in the process uh, to be acquired or to meet the good guys who propose your solution. No, all the banks, without exception, all the big banks, perhaps not the very small one, but they are really team focused on this open innovation, globally speaking, which is not, as you mentioned, only fintech, by the way, because you can do really nice open innovation with something which is out of your field, but this is another subject. So they have team focused on that. So it's, you know where to knock on the door, and you have some processes, and they try to work also to lighten these processes, because the problem usually is a fintech. They are a team of five to 10 people, and in a bank, just the meeting room for the people to welcome them is already 20 people. <laughs> so, because you have a guy in each department wanting to be there and saying he has something to say or be there. So, and it's very long, because at the end of the meeting, the only decision will be what is the date of the next meeting. And for this guy, it's not enough. So we have a problem of time frame, but it's beginning to work better. It's beginning to go quicker. They hire also younger people to work with this kind of team. So this is the first, um, the first way to answer. Another one is we, after many conferences and so on, what we can say and is that for banks, that's nothing more than external R&D. Most of the bank in Europe for the last 15 years, um, their marketing and R&D was, if you put IT aside, for customer, it was to decide the color of the credit card. So now they use a fintech as, you know, IDs, R&D, uh, to, to test IDs. Okay, is it working? Is there a market for that? Do people want really to have real time on the phone of the transactions they do? Not so sure. Oh, number 26 seems to be working fine. Let's buy a competitor and integrate that. So they use that as externalization of R&D. And if you look what happened in the telco industry in the 90s, they did umpire with that strategy. They just, I mean, Orange today is just an aggregation of hundreds of small companies they bought, whatever the price, and it's working fine. Just your comment, but just one thing. In, the, in, my, in KPMG last FinTech conference, I think a month ago, where I presented a picture of a porcupine hugging a cactus. And I, I, and I said that's the way that we are seeing those kind of relationships happening between financial institutions and banks. They, are, they have their own spikes, and they are trying to find the right way to, to, to hug each other. Do you see that in the same type of thing in your local market? Well, I, I think it's, it, it's uh, of course, many, many, many aspects on this, but I, I think it's still about people. So you do need to find the right people in, in each bank, and some of them are more innovative and some of them less, but I think it's still about whoever is driving the thing. It might be that, uh, you know, that it's the innovation manager who is really will want, want to do many things, but, you know, of course, the internal processes is not maybe you know, able to move things. And I think there, for example, any kind of facilitators, whatever form they are, uh, consulting companies or accelerators or other, other businesses, can help them to really find, you know, define the problems and find the right partners to work with. But sometimes, you know, for us, we, we, work, we work, of course, with innovation managers, but we also work with separate businesses. So sometimes it, it is a business unit who comes up, you know, says, in our bank, this department would like to develop this kind of product, but we know if we start doing it internally, it will take years. So could you please find us, you know, companies in this in this area, whatever it is, um, chatbot or, you know, some other more defined, uh, you know, know your customer, other processes, mm -hmm. and that's where we can help. But uh, yeah, so we, we try to tell the banks that actually you shouldn't see the startup as a threat. You should see them, as you say, um, external R&D or what we like to call it as you can outsource your failure. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know that you know you don't have to. It wasn't my fault. It was the startup who couldn't do it. And and I think it, it maybe takes take some little pressure out of the you know the person who has to make the decision if they want to work with the startup or not. So just like question, last question before going to the audience questions. What is your suggestions or recommendations for both sides, for financial institutions sitting here in the room, or for the entrepreneurs, what is the best way to approach? Do they need a local business or implementation partner? They, they should speak with the innovation or the right, or to find by themselves the right stakeholders. What is your take on that? Well, I think what we have seen that, that actually it works with, with having to, whatever you call it, but somebody outside from your own company maybe. Because it's very difficult, you know, we were talking about this sometimes about culture and the startup culture and the corporate culture is normally like, you know, like the cactus and the, <laughs> the person you were talking. So you, you can imitate a certain kind of culture, but it's difficult to implement it if you, if you don't have it. And I think there, if you have like a facilitator in whichever form it is, I'm, I'm sure, I, I think we have seen it at least that it does help. 
yeah, if we agree always on outside facilitator or in such environment could be helpful, of course. Um, but also lighten the processes. I mean, again, you cannot have like a three months process mind for a startup and a 12 months for a bank just to take a decision. So not only speaking about acquisition, but just work together and so on. So for example, the buying process are very important in bank. And uh, uh, one of the biggest bank in France, the BPC, just said that they engage that by the next three years, uh, uh, they will allocate a big part of their uh, buying every year, which is in billions uh, for fintechs. But even a big part is still only in three years, and it's still with quite long processes. So they have really to improve a lot to make these people able to discuss and work together. It's a question of pace and communication and rhythm. But of course, I agree with you, external people always can, can help. Um, so I, I would like to maybe present a different perspective. Uh, I, I would call it uh, a three-way or tresemme, if you wish. <laughs> um, and that would be, uh, you know, um, I think that uh, for organizations like uh, DNH, for example, where they got open innovation practice by themselves, uh, very happy to partner with uh, fintechs that would enhance uh, our opportunities with banks. And that would be able, you know, partnering in a three ways. So basically, a mature fintech organization with uh, a startup fintech and a bank would be an interesting value add for all parties uh, and an interesting way to mediate the challenges on each side of any party. Guys, we have uh, two minutes, so just uh, if you have any questions from the audience, please. Yeah. Since these are all the hand microphones, if you've got a question, I'll come and give you the microphone. Anyone got a question for the panel? Anyone? We have a question over here. Please say your name and uh, who your question's to. Uh, Irita Shkenazi from Winova Company. Uh, I want to ask from the point of view of the startup company, when uh, there is a situation that they work with the bank, the first bank that uh, are interested in the, their uh, product, the bank invests uh, knowledge, invests experience, of, uh, and he wants value. From the point of view of the startup company, if the bank come and say, I want exclusivity, how uh, you feel about it? I think we always uh, think it's, it's in nobody's interest normally, normally to have an exclusivity. If it's, of course, a different story if you want to buy the startup. But I think it's, it's limiting yourself as, as a bank or finance institute. If, if, the, if the startup is not able to work with anybody else, how can they develop uh, the product? I think it's normally not in anyone's interest. Of course, maybe it's some crazy genius idea that they develop and then you want to buy them. It's a different story. But normally we would always, you need, the startup would have to calculate, does it make sense to give them exclusivity? How much are they willing to pay for it? So I think this is the easy calculation to, to make, or somewhat easy, hopefully. Quite the same on Troy, what do you get for that? I mean, it's like in any contract, you want something, why not? The world cannot be like that, it's just what do you get for it? If they give you millions for years, you can still listen to the question. I think on exclusivity, um, it's a common way to, you know, to um, protect the interest of the bank. Uh, however, uh, normally what I've seen in the past is that exclusivity is limited by time and limited by geography. So basically, if startup is looking at the, the global market and is working, for example, here in Israel with one of, a, of the banks as a design partner, limiting the exclusivity to Israel for a year or two, that would work well, because obviously the startup is looking to, to get, you know, global. I just want to thank you, everybody. We did it on time, exactly. Thank you for uh, Maria, Lauren, Nir. Thank you for your time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you. Thank you.